Hey everyone, welcome back to STEMAGIR. You don't want to miss today's video. You're in for a real treat. Many of us have heard of pharmacists, and we know them because they help us fill medicine that doctors prescribe to us. But there's so much more that pharmacists do. In this two-part series, you will learn about pharmacists and a lot of the cool things that you never knew about the field of pharmacy, so stay tuned. Before we get started, be sure to click the like button and subscribe if you enjoy my videos. Also, be sure to share this video with your friends and all of your family. And now, let's explore the field of pharmacy with our special guest, Dr. Melissa Brent. Dr. Melissa Brent is a licensed pharmacist with a background in specialty pharmacy, medication therapy management, chronic disease management, and project management. She completed her undergraduate degree at Virginia Tech in Biology. She also completed her Doctor of Pharmacy, or PharmD, program at the Medical College of Virginia, or Virginia Commonwealth University, or VCU. She has so much information to share with us, so let's get started. Okay. How do you fill prescription medicines? For example, how do you know that you're pulling the right medicine? Do you ever have to mix things to fill prescription? to fill a prescription? Yeah, good question. Great question. So I can go really into this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know I've said so much, but I'm so excited about being a pharmacist. So again, once that prescription comes to you, you're gonna get that paper copy. You're gonna read it, see if it makes sense. And you'll see that doctors will, like I said, they have their own language, we really do. So some things like PO, do you see that on a prescription? That means by mouth. If you oh. see the word, BID, that means twice a day. Mm -hmm. So if they are writing a prescription, they may say, take this medication, P-O-B-I-D. So of course your normal person is like, I don't know what this means. So we look at it, does it make sense? Is it going the right, right route? Um, after we get that, we put it into a computer-based system. And that computer base also has another checking point to make sure that things make sense to you and it'll go ahead and print out everything we want. So we basically take that, that language the doctor wrote and we write it in a language that makes sense for the person. So we can say, take this tablet twice a day. We may add, you know, by morning, by night, with food, things that may have an effect on that drug. It prints out, then on there is something called an NDC. So it's actually a very special code that each drug has, this little number called an NDC, and it's special to that drug. So your technician will use that and they'll go pull that drug, again, this is the retail setting, off the shelf and check everything on there and make sure it's right. Pharmacist checks it again for that last verification. And then once that medication gets verified, we kind of staple it in that bag. Once it's stapled, it can't be opened again. The only time that can be opened is when the patient has it so that nothing changes. So that is your, your retail setting. In your home infusion setting, same idea. We get those orders, we make sense of those orders, we type in those orders so that we can get a prescription label. Then we mix the drug. Then we had kind of, if there's a prescription, that prescription follows the drug the whole way so everybody can see what it's supposed to be. We check it again. We give it to another person, they check it again. We may pull any supplies that are needed and we box it up and it goes right out that door. As far as mixing for home infusion, there's mixing called sterile compounding. For non-home infusion, there's usually uh, non-sterile compounding of drugs. So if we go to your retail setting, usually the mixing that you see in there is it's like a powder form liquid that needs to be made to something that the patient can drink. So we'll actually put distilled water, a certain amount of volume based on what the manufacturer recommends. We'll go in there and we'll shake it all up and get it all nice and we can add flavor to it if the patient wants. So for younger children, we may ask do they want strawberry or banana and we can add some flavoring to it. That's usually again, what we call non-sterile compounding. Another non-sterile compounding would be making a cream. So you come in, you have some kind of rash or inflammation, we can actually put different creams and measure those powders and we triturate it in a, what they call a mortar. So we kind of break down that powder. We may make it into a cream. 
and we can kind of mix these different ingredients that the doctor calls for and we'll give it to the patient as well. Now, in the sense of what I do, there's sterile compounding. The sterile compounding is important, right? Because these drugs that I work on, they have to go into the bloodstream, into the vein. So they cannot have any particles, they cannot have any viruses or bacteria, and they have to be made in a very special condition. So usually for the, the medications I do, the drug is a powder form that the doctor is asking for. Sometimes it's a liquid and it needs to just be added into a bigger liquid. So we'll get that and we go into a special, uh, what we call a clean room. And in order to get in that clean room, we have to do a lot of changing of our clothes. Just kind of like what you see on TV, a lot of hand washing, a lot of special clothes. By the time we make it into the clean room, we are fully garbed up. The only thing you can see is our eyes. We have gloves on, we have a full suit on, everything to try to limit any type of exposure that the outside could have, right? Because we know there's bacteria and there's virus and there's particles everywhere. We can't put that in patient's drugs that's going into their vein because that would be very dangerous. So in those cases, we have what we mix is a, a, called a hood. So once we get in there, we go in this other environment where it's like a really closed kind of square shaped place where we have to mix the drug. And the only thing that fits in there is your hands. So you just put your hands in there, you mix all your drugs, you use lots of cleaning agents, very, very smelly, but very strong cleaning agents along the way. And you mix the drug there. Once it's all mixed, take it out, you label it, have somebody else check it, and then it gets to the patient. Okay. Now, what does it take to become a pharmacist? For example, are there any classes that are important to take? And do you need a degree? And if so, what kind do you need? Another good, good question. So a pharmacist is a doctor. A lot of people don't know that. Oh. We actually have to get our doctorate degree. So I think before 2000, it was a bachelor's degree, which is a four-year college degree. And then around 2000, they changed it and said, we want all pharmacists to get doctorates. That's the requirement moving forward. So that actually entails a total of six years. Now, most pharmacists that you meet probably have done eight years. A lot of times we do our, our four-year undergrad. So we'll get a degree, a bachelor's, maybe in some sort of science, biology or chemistry. And then after that, we'll go into pharmacy school and do another four years of pharmacy school. It's just dedicated to just pharmacy-related learning. Um, again, you can just do two years of undergrad and then four years of pharmacy school. Or if you choose, you can do four years, get a bachelor's, and then go into pharmacy school and do another four years, which is the route I actually took. Now, there, you mentioned before, there's some specialty pharmacists like the nuclear pharmacists. Uh, they actually go on after that and do more years, which is usually about one to two years, depending on what your specialty is. Um, not only is there nuclear pharmacists, but there's ones who specialize in cancer drugs, there's ones who specialize in drugs for older people. Uh, there's ones that specialize in drugs for younger people. They have this extra learning that's even further than that. Uh, but the traditional, I would say your traditional is anywhere between six to eight years, but a doctorate is required. In regards to classes that I think are important, you gotta love science. Because this is a lot of science. You have to, you got to know the human body, right? So that's the biology and the human anatomy and physiology classes. Because you not only need to know what's happening on the outside of the body, but what's happening on the inside of the body. How does a drug make it from your mouth to that place that's hurting in your knee or that headache? How does that all work? Um, so that's usually the biology part. And then there's the chemistry part, right? It's how these drugs are made so that they know to target these specific areas of inflammation in there. And how fast is it supposed to go? And what, P, what they call pH, is it too acidic or basic? Because we our bodies are very, very complex. And in order to get something in there and to make sure it's working, we have to meet all the, the stringent requirements of our body or our body would just reject it, right? It would be like, nope, can't have it. I'm gonna toss it up, I'm not gonna have it at all. Mm. So. <laughs> So that's kind of some of the classes I think are important. Some of the non-traditional classes that I think are important are communications. 
So people really don't think about that. But one of the things I've learned along the way is not only are we getting um, these medications that are complicated, but we have to communicate that to our patients. You know, we have to be able to take very difficult science lingo and we need to break it down and talk to patients of all different ages, young, older, different educational backgrounds, and be able to make it make sense to them. So that is a, a key class. And I know that it was a class I was required to take. I don't know if every pharmacy school requires communication, but I think it's vital. It's absolutely vital. And then some of the other non-traditional ones may be like economics, like a business class, because shockingly, you know, pharmacy is a business. It is a business. So we have to we have to be profitable for the most part. You know, there are a lot of the ones that we're working for, like CBS and Target, want, need to make money. And there's all these numbers behind how much a drug costs, how much an insurance pays, and then what you have called a copay, right? What the patient pays. So having that general background, I think, is also good because you will see pharmacists who are at the higher senior level and they are looking at the business aspect of a pharmacy. But loving science, being able to communicate are the key points. Okay. Can you share with us any cool facts or fun stories about being a pharmacist? Cool facts. Well, Coca-Cola was made by a pharmacist. I don't know if everybody knows that. I think that's pretty cool. (laughs) Uh, One of the other things I find to be cool is women now make up most of the pharmacists. So before, you know, in the past, it was mostly men that made up pharmacists, but now women are taking over. There's actually, most of your pharmacists are women now, greater than 50% of them are women. So I find that to be a really interesting, interesting fact uh, with women kind of owning that market. I don't particularly know why that, why that is, but it is a change that's happening. Um, another one that people don't really realize is just because I'm a pharmacist doesn't mean I can practice in any state. I have to get a license for every single state that I practice in. So uh, for me, I have a license in Virginia, but I also have one in West Virginia. I have one in Rhode Island. I have one in uh, Louisiana, some other places. If you So if we just get up and we're like, hey, let's move, I got to take another test. So it's not just like I can apply. I have to read that state law and I have to take a law exam for that particular state. Um, There's some that kind of use the same type of law questions, uh, but either way, each state usually has their own laws and then they have a federal law that guides all of them. So that's kind of, uh, it it makes our job a little harder because then if we want to move, we have to pass the test, you know? (laughs) But I find that to be a very cool thing about pharmacists as well. I think the, you know, honestly, the best, Thing. I'm going to just throw that in there too about being a pharmacist and what I find to be the most cool thing is that we really get to meet a lot of different people. So, you know, I think people don't realize that we get to really have conversations with people with all different types of conditions. So we have patients who are dying, you know, and, and that's a very sad thing. We have patients who are just, they have a little, a virus, it's going to go away bacteria. We have older patients, younger patients. We learn a lot about our patients. We know their secrets, right? Because a lot of times if somebody's battling with something, they don't always tell everybody, they kind of hold that in. But, but we know, just like your physicians, we kind of know those, those hidden secrets. And we get to share that journey with our patients from the time that maybe they start off in a bad position and sometimes they get better. And it's amazing to watch that happen. Um, you know, we have to be supportive you can get patients who they've gotten a rare disease that's tough for them you know we have to have that compassion for them so i i like that i think that's kind of cool i think you know if you want to be a pharmacist you do have to like people and <laughs> tell people you know that you're interacting with so so many different people so that's that's another cool thing i think about being a pharmacist that i enjoy most about my job um and then lastly we, get to, we make drugs for animals too so that's kind of fun oh. Yeah, so we have animals who have anxiety, animals get anxiety too. Um, so we actually will give medication for anxiety. One of the coolest 
medications I made is there's something called TPNs, and those are nutritional bags. So a lot of times we have, you know, if a patient can't, uh, they're in a coma, they can't eat, right? So how do they get their nutrition? When we make their bags, we kind of look at them and we say, this is how much fat you need, how much protein you need, how much sugar you need in order to sustain this life. And we, we make it all in a big bag and we give it to them by IV route. Well, we had a horse that actually needed a, a nutritional bag and it was this big old horse, you know, and it was the first time we ever had to make a nutritional bag for, for a horse, but the owner loved their horse. Their poor horse was not doing well and they wanted the horse to have all the nutrition while it wasn't doing well. So we got to go in there and make some really cool medication for this horse. Um, I would say horse is probably the most unique. I've made medications for birds too. Mm -hmm. So I think that's kind of fun. We're not just making medications for humans, we're making your medications for animals. I mean, animals for people are family. So those owners want to make sure their animals get what they need. Okay. Thank you again for taking the time out of your day to be here. I think our viewers learned a lot from your stories and exactly what pharmacists do and what they are. Yeah, no, and thank you for, for interviewing me. Thank you for asking about pharmacists because I don't think so many, a lot of people know what they do. So mm -hmm. I was so excited that you asked me to interview and share what I do with you. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks for watching this step of your series about pharmacists. Hopefully you learn about this important career and a lot of cool facts that you can share with your friends. If you enjoyed this video, remember to subscribe to my channel and click that like button. I'll see you in the next video.